Coming up. Watch out. Complete headlight refurb. Epic battle. Dog versus horse. Oil leaks. Now coming from the roof. Oh. And it's gone. The money. So the final number is... Hello, welcome. Part 5 of Project X5. Let's finish this thing. Great intro. Anyway, in the previous episode we overhauled complete front suspension. Everything is brand spanking new. The only thing we are left with are the rear shocks. So let's replace them. This X5 has self-leveling in the back, which means it has air springs instead of conventional coil springs. I also want to replace this due to aging kilometers, but before we start messing with it, we need to drain the air out of the system, release the pressure. Haha! <laughs> Wear this. Now you need to release these two tabs here and push up the spring. Now we need to rotate this thing clockwise. There is an airline on the top, so we gotta be careful with this. There it is. 10 mil. Now we need to access the top mount, which is somewhere over here. Rivets. I'm almost not long enough to reach that one. Oh yeah. Oh, I forgot about the brake line. Is it any good? No, it's not. It's completely blown. Does not rebound. A sleeve. Blown shock and blown bump stop. 100% kaput! Original, 2008. First bump stop. Gonna clean this. There's a gasket here. Brand new air spring. From Bilstein. Remove the old gasket. And clean. Finger tight, and this one is torqued with the suspension fully loaded. New airbag comes with new connections, so we're gonna remove the old one. Have to clean this. Nice and snug. <laughs> I got the right size rear sway bar bushings. Now I need to get Ista going, find a function to activate the compressor and fill up the airbags. Yes. Perfect. This one is seated properly and so is the other one. That's done. Now we're gonna bleed the brakes. Filter. Now the fluid went everywhere. Nope. I need three hands. Now we're gonna add fresh fluid.
Now we're going to replace front and rear differential oil. This is the correct spec fluid from Liquid Molly. And we're also going to replace transfer case fluid, which is DTF1 fluid. Unfortunately, Liquid Molly doesn't carry it out, so I went with another brand. We're going to start with the rear differential, and BMW decided to make it interesting here and not put a drain plug on it. So this is the fill plug and the drain plug. Need to remove this, extract the fluid, withdraw the fluid, and then fill it through the same hole. Clean it first. Doesn't look too bad. <laughs> All right, that's it. We got one liter out. Now we're gonna start filling up the diff until the fluid starts overflowing. Let it drip out and then we can reinstall the plug. That's it. Now we're gonna let it drip out. Put the plug back in. Nice, good and twist. Transfer case fluid. First we're gonna remove the fill plug. Ooh, really ugly. This one only takes around 600 milliliters. Same dealio as before. And now the front differential, the drain plug is right over here, but the fill plug is somewhere over here. There it is, now you can see it. Look, I can't even get one finger to it. Ew. That one is very nasty. Look at that. That does not look good. Flush it a little bit. And with that, we replaced all of the fluids on the car and they're nice and fresh. If I look sleeker than usual, that's because I have differential fluid in my hair. Time to put the wheels back on. Hold that. Brand new winter tires for the rear. Now we're gonna drive it on the four post lift so we can finish torquing the suspension, but tomorrow, it's supper time now. And beer time as well. Good morning! V10, baby! You know I got blah, 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 blah. I know all of the lyrics. And now V12. Whoa! Whoa! The touring looks good. Ah! I've nearly crushed the X5. This one here is also torqued to 165 millimeters. The thing is, the nut is on this side and the torque wrench can't fit in there. So someone mentioned in the previous video that I can also torque by the bolt, but just need to add 10% more of the torque. So 165, 10% more that comes to 181.5 millimeters. And with that, we finished torquing the suspension. Now I'm gonna fire up ISTA and see if the rear suspension needs to be adjusted. There's a calibration process for that. So according to TS, we need to measure from the bottom of the rim flange until the wheel arch and see what the measurement is. 694, 694 millimeters. Rear left, 690. Continue. The vehicle ride height level is within the tolerance limit. It says that the adjustment is not needed. The compressor is running. Ah, okay, it raised the rear, so it doesn't need adjustment. Now it's perfectly leveled front to rear. So you just added more air in the back, and now we are at, yep, 722 millimeters, which is what the spec sheet says. And then this side, about the same, yeah, 720. Clean reinforcement plate. All of this was covered in oil previously. 
And now 90 degree angle, say from there. That's 90. Transmission cover. This as well I cleaned. Look who's back, Mitzi. And now the engine cover, I bought this one used from Marianne from Alta Tyler Goldstein. It's in good condition, he gave me a good deal. This is normally really expensive if you buy it brand new. And that's the undercarriage of the X5 buttoned up. Now we're gonna replace the taillights. This one has stuff growing in it. You can see a big black spot over there. This one has a lot of micro cracks from the sun towards the bottom. This one here barely works, the stripes here, and this one has a big scuff on the side that you can't polish out. So time to refresh them. Hello, Mitzi. You wanna be in the back of the X5, huh? What do you think of that? Hmm? This is horsepower, Mitzi's new friend. Oh, is it as easy as that? What do you think, Mucci? There's only one bolt? Wouldn't that be nice? Why so cute, huh? Connector disconnected. <clears throat> That's not right. Should be a nice gasket here, not this stuff. But anyway, Mutsi, I didn't need to remove this cover here that I removed previously, you know? How am I supposed to work when I have a cute dog here? Brand new OE taillights from Magneti Morelli or AL Automotive Lighting. It's the same company. Normally we would go with LCI parts, but in this particular case, we're not going to because I don't like LCI taillights on D70. To me, they look too modern, too off the market-ish, and just like they don't belong on this chassis, they belong on the F15. But these I particularly like because they remind me of E39 facelift taillights because of the LED stripes here, and they look really cool at night. And on the inside, you can see that this one says BMW, and this one doesn't, and that's the main difference. But other than that, they're exactly the same. All of the same part numbers on the side, they look exactly the same. They're made by the same company. Only this one costs a lot less than this one that you would get directly from the dealer. Cutest little puppy ever. And no, unfortunately, this is not my dog. We're babysitting her again for our friends. And this is a Maltese. She's four years old. And she's so cute. We need to clean this up. Whoa, goo gone. Bit of alcohol now. Anyway, I'm not gonna throw these away. Someone might be able to use them. I mean, it's better than cracked or broken taillights. If you want them, email me. I want nothing for them. Just tell me you want them and I'll ship them to you. And yes, the dent is annoying. I'm gonna have PDR guy pull all of this out. Though I'm not sure if he can do anything about this one because it's right on the edge. New taillights come with new gaskets, of course. And now the most satisfying part, Ah, yes. Works perfect on both sides. Fog lights. Perfect. Everything working as it should. Mutsi is all but confused as to what's happening. Think I'm gonna find some LEDs for the license plate lights. Oh, snap. These are the same as E60. Yes, it is. Ah, yes, much better. So these are original LED lights from the F10 5 Series. And I have these on my E60 and they're wonderful because they're not too bright. All right, I only have one, unfortunately, but I'm gonna order one more. And then once that comes in, I'm gonna swap these out. Really happy about that development. Now I'm gonna ceramic coat the taillights for extra protection. First surface prep. Ceramic coating from Gion.
And now the headlights, as you can see, they look really ugly. The covers are super yellow. They have a ton of micro scratches and micro cracks from the sun. You can't polish that up. You can try, you'll make it a bit better, but it's not gonna look good and it's not up to my standard. On top of that, the light output at night is pretty crappy. The projectors are really weak and they don't shine as good as they should. Normally I would just swap in brand new headlights, but on this car, one headlight OE costs over thousand euros which is pretty ridiculous, but they are by Xenon adaptive headlights, so they're just expensive by nature. That being said, these are European spec headlights, so we don't need to replace them completely. So instead, we're gonna work with what we have and refurbish the current headlights, replace the covers, and upgrade the projectors. Say hello to parts, brand new headlight covers, brand new bulbs all around, and these are the projectors that were provided to me by a company from Czech Republic, Lights One. They are really nice fellas, and they know everything about headlights and Xenon projector retrofits. These are probably the best projectors you can get for the E70. They've done a ton of those headlights as well as E65 and other BMW models, as well as other car brands. So if you're looking to upgrade and buy projectors for your car, they are a fantastic company. That being said, there are no instructions how to do this and I couldn't find any info online. I couldn't find anyone retrofitting or replacing Xenon projectors in the E70 headlights. So it should be fairly fun. And this, well, that is a treat for Mutsi. Uh -huh. Okay, it's coming, it's coming. Mm. Oh, dropped it. That's it, no mass. Spin, spin, spin. Now I'm gonna remove this headlight, and in order to do that, we need to remove the wheel, the left side of the fender liner, the headlight bracket, and then we can pull out the headlight this way. This didn't require removal, it was just, whatever. One and two T30 screws. Now we need to remove the headlight bracket and this stud here is unreasonably long. I almost broke the bracket while removing this on the other side. So we're simply going to cut it flush with the nut and that way it'll be much easier to pull out the bracket. Otherwise you need to remove the entire fender and the bumper so you can slide it out this way. And uh, if you don't do that and you try to use a lot of force here, the bracket can break and we don't want that. And I don't understand why it's this long. It just doesn't make any sense. No such thing as easy on this car. Forget about it. See what I mean? Even now it's difficult to pull it out. Oh. Now you have the airbag sensor here. If you disconnect it and the battery is still connected, you're gonna have a code for that, which you need to clear later. Oh, will you? Before we start, I already did the headlight on the right side just so I can see if I can do this and how difficult it is. Spoiler alert, it's pretty difficult. This is the stock projector that came out of this headlight. These are AL headlights. And this puppy here is completely toast. The reflecting surface inside, it's completely burned. And this is trash. You can set it out to be re-chromed or whatever, but don't bother. These are really old projectors from 90s developed by Bosch. This puppy here is far superior than this one. It has a clear lens, while this one doesn't. So the cutoff line, it's much nicer, it's much sharper, and the light output is much stronger. That said, as you can see, they're not exactly the same, and a lot of trimming, cutting, and modifying is needed to fit this one. So it took a bit of time to figure out everything, and now I can explain everything in detail. Uh, however, if you don't wanna mess with that, cutting, trimming, modifying, and everything that comes with it, you can buy Bosch AL replica projectors, which is the exact same projector as this one, except it's replica, but physically it's the same, and it'll bolt right in, just unscrew it, put it in, done. The caveat with the replica is the beam pattern, the light output, it's really narrow. Everything is centered in the middle. At least that's what I read online. And it emits about one third of what the stock projector emits. So there's that. In any case, it's better than completely burned projectors, but I wanna go for a proper, really, really good projector 
which is this one and uh, the guys from Switlip have been running these projectors for about 250,000 kilometers on one car and the projector is still absolutely perfect. The reflecting surface and everything, these are really robust. As usual, we're starting by cleaning and minimizing the amount of crap that goes into the headlight. Compressed air. That's sufficient for now. We're gonna clean it one more time before final assembly. So these headlights have biodegradable wiring and on the right side, it was pretty bad. And same thing here, the insulation is crumbling and you have wires touching each other and that's when you get sparks and flames and the car burns down to the ground. Best case scenario, some function of the headlight is gonna stop working. That happened on the right side. The adaptive function was not working because the wires were touching and I think it fried the sensor here, which I replaced and then everything started working and the high beams weren't working because the wires were completely cut. This headlight is not meant to be serviced. This is a permaseal headlight. The cover is permanently bonded to the housing with glue sealants. You can hit this with the heat gun. You can put it in the oven for three days. It's not going to soften up and you're not going to be able to pull this cover easily. The best way and easiest way to do it is to simply cut around and then break the plastic off and clean the channel, which is what we're gonna do. You can buy some special tools to get them in here and then kind of cut through the sealant and that way you can save the cover. But this one is completely shot and I have brand new covers. So we're just gonna cut around and remove it that way. Be careful when you're cutting, there are screws here, here and on the bottom that hold this inner trim piece to the cover. So just cut around it and then once you disassemble the headlight, you can pull off that easily and unscrew them from the back. Don't cut too deep either, otherwise you're gonna go through the plastic. Not that it matters, you can't see this once it's back on the car. So here you're gonna witness some crispy wiring. See that? Bad, really bad. There are two screws on the back, one here, and another one in this corner here. Now I'm gonna carefully cut around the bolts here so we can carefully remove this trim. So these are the little screws that I was talking about. You gotta be really careful with this, otherwise you're gonna break them here and then you can't screw this back to the new cover. Now we're gonna remove this chrome piece with angel eyes. We have screws all around holding it in place. And these are not high beams, they just supply light to the angel eyes. There are three clips on the back holding this plastic trim in place. That was one. And that one broke. Perfect. What are you gonna do? Remove this cover here. Now I'm gonna remove the projector with the bracket for the adaptive function. So first disconnect this connector here. There's glue on it, so you might need to cut it. Two screws here. Squeeze this clip here with pliers. Now you need to get this out of this rotating, swiveling plastic thing. Two connectors on the back. This one is for the high beams. And this one is for the adaptive motor. It's a bit difficult to show this on the camera, but you can see how it starts with chrome there. And then as you go inside, it's black. That's all burned surface. And this projector is, is bad. Now you're gonna remove the wiring. First, we need to remove this self-leveling motor with a bracket. Now we can start removing the wiring. There are two clips holding this connector in. I like to put a zip tie here and then another one on the top and then you can push it out like that and the clips are intact and this is the naked housing and look at this this is fire hazard if i do this it's 
completely crumbling. We're gonna start with the wiring harness which needs to be refurbished. The wires itself are good, they're copper wires. The insulation is the problem. It's made from biodegradable materials, so it's crumbling apart. And this is a huge issue because when two wires touch, it can cause a fire, it can melt the whole headlight, or the whole car is gonna go up in flames. So to do this, we're going to depend the connectors, remove the old insulation completely, use Scotch Pride and WD-40 to clean up the wire because there's some copper oxide on it, and then follow up with contact cleaner. After that, slide correct size heat shrink tubing over the pin and onto the wire, use a heat gun and create new insulation. Some of the pins are too big, so you can't slide over correct size heat shrink tubing. So you're gonna have to cut the wire, slide it over, and then resolder the wire and do it that way. Going one by one is the best way to do it. That way you don't mix up the pins. Slide it all the way in, making sure the wires can't touch. That's it, new insulation created, simple as that. Put the pin back in its place, make sure it clicks all the way in. There you go. And then it's rinse and repeat for the rest of them. Almost done, just need to solder in the connector for the new projector. For the high beams, it's different than the stock one. Perfect. Now we're gonna focus on the projector. This car has, as I mentioned earlier, adaptive headlights. That means that the headlights or the projectors within the headlights follow the road as you drive. If you turn to the left or to the right, the projector is gonna swivel inside of this bracket and follow the road. It does that with the help of this motor on the bottom. There's a bracket here, another one at the top, and then the projector can swivel freely inside of this bracket. Really neat feature and something we definitely want to keep. But now we're going to disassemble it further and then I can demonstrate exactly how it works. By the way, if I seem slower than usual, I'm finding it cold. Now we're going to remove the motor that drives this adaptive function. This here is a joint, so you can just pull it straight up. And now you can see exactly how this works. This is the bracket that's stationary and the projector moves like this. Rather simple, yet very effective. Now we're gonna remove the projector. We have four screws holding it in and a nut on the back. So this bracket pulls straight up. This is the bracket specifically for this headlight. So this headlight can't fit in here. The clearance, we don't have it. First, we need to fit this bracket to the projector. And even here, we need to do some grinding. This notch here on the projector is in the way and you can't line up the threads here with the holes on the projector to start the screws. So we need to slightly grind this down and then the bracket will sit perfectly. So I'm gonna mark it with a marker. You can see here how the holes don't line up because the bracket is hitting this notch on the projector. You can use a file, but I think I'm gonna fire up my Dremel tool. That'll be quicker. With that done, we can mount the bracket. Screws come with it. We'll need to remove this bracket again a bit later in order to expand the holes here so we can rotate the projector within the bracket and line up the cutoff line properly, but more on that a bit later. This is what happens when you try to fit the projector. It's sitting here on the top, on the sides as well. So all of that we need to grind down with a Dremel or something, and then it'll fit and this will be able to move freely inside. So first we're gonna remove this bracket here. I marked with the marker all of the places where we need to thin out the bracket here here as well, all of this, and then on the top, these fins here. We also need to grind out the corners of the bracket here.
we are ready to test fit. For the top screws, you can either grind down the surface on the projector housing here, so the screw can fit from this side, or if you do it from this side, it's gonna hit the projector housing, so I'm gonna simply shorten the bolt because it's not necessary that it's this long. I shortened the screws. There you have it. After 300 years of trimming, the projector fits and moves freely. This is the center, all the way left, all the way right. Perfect fitment and it doesn't rub or catch on anything. With that done, we need to remove the projector, fit this bracket, which we'll also need to trim. In the end, this bracket here needed to be trimmed down and the plastic adaptive bracket here, here on the top, all around here, and then a bit on the metal bracket on the bottom. So a lot of trimming is needed to fit this projector, but trust me, it's worth it. And thankfully this is nice thick plastic, so it's still firm and uh, it's not, well, it's structurally a bit weaker, but you know, it's still strong enough to hold the projector in. It's not gonna break. And this is how to trim down this bracket and the screw. Now you're gonna put back the motor. And this can go on the side. Now we're gonna start with the housing. We need to remove all of the old plastic and clean the groove thoroughly. I bought some tools online that should help us get this plastic out a bit easier and to clean it as well. So to do this, collection of pliers, cutters, screwdrivers, then just start pulling and breaking stuff. Let's try the tools that I bought. Yeah, that's not gonna work. That ain't gonna work. And I remove that. It is a completely useless tool. They can't fit in the groove. Yeah, whatever. Definitely wear safety glasses. And that's the last bit of plastic. All right, now comes the ever so boring task of cleaning up this groove. We are going to use butyl to seal the headlights, so all of this needs to be perfectly clean. Let's try, well, this thing, I don't know. I'm gonna say right now, these tools are absolutely not worth the money. I also have silicon remover here. This is gonna, well, make it a bit softer and easier to remove. Let me just show you where we're at right now. All of the sealant needs to go. Oh, this tools at all. So various screwdrivers, scotch bright with silicon remover, and the groove is gonna look brand spanking new once we're done. Three hundred days later, the headlight is finally clean, and yes, my voice has officially gone to shit. Now we're gonna clean up. Now we're gonna do the final round of cleaning of the housing, and then we can start with the assembly. That is one thoroughly clean housing. Now we can start fitting the wires. One clip here broke. I don't even remember that happening. So I'm gonna have to glue this in place. By the way, this stuff is incredible, speedy fix. I used it to repair a lot of plastic and it's really good. On the other headlight, I had to repair one bracket here, one holder, worked perfectly. And for this as well, bit of silicone spray for the gears here, self-leveling motor with a bracket, xenon ballast. This is the SMC module for the adaptive function. Brand new bulbs, Osram Nightbreaker. I have really good experience with these. This is mounted around the bulb. Now we need to connect all of the wires and stuff. Brand new silver bulbs. And here we're gonna run the old one for now. And with that, we are ready to test it. Turn signal, high beams, 
these are bi-xenon projectors. So when you pull the high beam lever, it opens the flap and the projector is shining with its full power. You can see how the projector goes up and down and left and right really quick and then it centers. That's how it should work. All right, now you need a clean wall, flat surface and about 10 meters of distance to make sure the cutoff line on the projector is lined up perfectly. I don't have that because there's a lot of junk in front of me and this garage isn't exactly leveled so we'll do our best might need to wait for darkness and take the car outside and then line it up somewhere you can see how beautiful the cutoff line looks like i need to lower the right headlight all right the projectors line up perfectly and maybe we don't need to adjust the left one after all that would be sweet now we need to wait for darkness and hopefully it stops raining and then i can take it outside and just make sure this is absolutely leveled. While we are waiting on the darkness, we're gonna hit the pause on the headlights and continue doing some other stuff. We have a spherical mirror glass that we're going to install, an adjustment motor for the left side. The one that's on the car right now is broken. So I tried to fix this one, but the gears are broken inside. Hence, I just went for the replacement one. New mirror. Beautiful. Not sorted. And the power folding function is working flawlessly on both sides. I received original LED license plate lights, so we're gonna replace that as well. Sound like a bird. So same as on the E60, it's spot on. It's not lining up the whole rear end, just the license plate. Very happy with that. Next up, we're going to replace the climate control panel. The old one has worn buttons. And we're also going to replace the cup holders because this cover here is broken. See what I mean? Clips. First, we need to remove the center vent actually. And we have two screws here. I'm gonna go fit the new one. This car doesn't have heated seats. As you can see, these buttons do absolutely nothing, which is a bummer. And I actually wanted to retrofit heated seats in this car because I love that option, especially my girlfriend, but it's not that easy on the E70. So on previous generations, you have leather, heating element, and then the cushion. On the E70, for whatever reason, the heating element is soon into the leather from the backside, so it's not as easy as removing the covers and putting that stuff in and just wiring everything and it's gonna work. I would either have to go with aftermarket ones, which I don't wanna do, or get extremely lucky and find the seats in the same color in good condition that have heating elements. And I've been searching all over the place and I've been unsuccessful in finding that particular seat. So for now, I'm not gonna put them in, it is what it is, but I bought the panel that has um, controls for the heated seats just in case I ever change my mind or if I ever find the seats. As you can see, the cover over the cup holders is broken. So we're going to replace them. And this trim here should pop out. Ooh, it has an ox, this car. That's cool. Except phones today don't have an ox. Okay, I'm a little bit confused now. This whole thing is rattling like crazy, but it's bolted in place firmly. What the shit, BNW? What the fuck? So to get to the cup holders, absolutely everything needs to come out. And I mean everything. I'm starting to hate this car a lot. There's a screw somewhere here. There it is. Come on. And then this one also slides forward. No wonder all of this shit rattles. Just a bunch of broken clips and shit. Oh, for f Shut up! I'm in no mood for this. Unbelievable. Let's put three million clips and screws all over the place, but the thing still rattles. How can this clip be so strong? 
Um, look at this. This entire garbage now can come out. Why am I doing this? Ah! That's the entire wiring harness out of the way. I did, I can't believe it. I thought this was gonna be a 10 minute job. Max, here I am, remove the entire central console. This is our prize, the cup holders. All right. All right, I'm gonna finish reinstalling all of this later. I'm running out of time. We need to go out and see if the projectors are good or not. Here we are outside and you can see that the cutoff line on both projectors is perfectly lined up and parallel. And that's the most important thing when you're retrofitting projectors, that this is straight. Uh, I still need to adjust them left to right, up and down, but that we can do later. The right one I had to adjust earlier before I did the left one. I had to rotate the projector, the line was going a bit like that, but now they're perfectly, perfectly aligned. And this saves a lot of time because I don't need to mess with the left projector at all. Now I'm gonna remove the projector again as we need to drill some holes here so we can mount this bracket here properly. This plastic bracket mounts onto the projector and then it holds this chrome ring. It has three tabs on the back, one of which broke when I was removing it, so I used Speedy Fix to glue it back together. Holds great. The problem is only one hole lines up with these clips here, the one on the bottom, and then you have two additional clips on the top. So we need to mark uh, where the clips go, drill a hole over there, and then this is gonna clip and stay firmly in place. It could possibly stay like this, but you can see it moves. And if it falls out, you're gonna have to disassemble the entire headlight to put it back in. So it's just better to drill the holes. So mark it on the back. Now compress there. All right, that's clipped in. To clean the ring, just clean carbon fiber cloth, no alcohol, do not rub, otherwise you're gonna remove this chrome finish. Make sure this clips in properly, and as you can see, this one on the bottom doesn't wanna clip in. So there, I'm gonna use a thin zip tie just to tie it in place. And this is now firmly in place. Again, no cleaners, just clean, dry carbon fiber. Brand new bulb. Now you're gonna clean this thing. Now you can put clean covers on the back. Now you need to clean up this plastic here. Don't use anything sticky or greasy to clean this plastic. Just Gion interior detailer. Just going to leave the surface clean with a matte finish. Don't rub the inside of it with a microfiber. You will leave micro scratches. Just use compressed air and blow it up. Mount the plastic trim. Now we're gonna start laying fresh butyl in the headlight groove all around. And this is going to seal the headlight properly and also make them serviceable. So if you ever need to take them apart in the future, heat gun all around and the headlight cover is gonna pop right off. This one is nine and a half, 10 millimeters thick, which is perfect for the groove on this headlight. It fills it in nicely all around. And feed it into the channel. Now we're gonna do 10 to 15 passes with a heat gun all around. That'll make butyl soft and tacky, and then we can push on the cover.
All right, final round with compressed air. Line up everything. So the clips need to clip in. There's one. Now we can start the screws here. Now we need to get these tabs over the clips here. Pliers with a bit of tape on them so we don't scratch anything. And just push it in. All of the clips are in. Look at that. No dust inside. Beautiful, clean, brand new lens. And you know what's the best part of it? This is actually a better headlight than the original one you can buy from the dealer. And that one is going to cost you, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 euro. This was, well, 300, 400 euros. But you get a far superior projector in this headlight. You get to refurbish everything yourself. And it's going to last a lot longer as well. At this point, ideally, you want to put PPF, paint protection film, on the brand new cover. Unfortunately, that's not allowed in Germany. So I'm just going to hit it with ceramic coating a bit later. Before we put the headlight in, we're gonna do a spot of cleaning. Contact spray. I just wanna line up the gaps here and then tighten the bolts. The fender liner and the bracket, I'm gonna do that a bit later off camera. Right now, I wanna put the wheels back on, take the car outside and make sure that the cutoff line is still perfectly aligned on both headlights. And if I need to adjust the headlights, I can do so while uh, the fender liner is off and I have access here. Here we are. Still need to do some final tweaking, but for the most part, this is spot on. The headlight output, I don't know if the camera can catch it, but it's about 100 times better than before. Now I'm going to show you a feature that I thought was actually an issue with the headlights, but it's not. Right now, the headlight switch is in number two position, headlights on. And now I'm going to switch it to position A, which is automatic headlights. See how the left one goes all the way to the left and then it lowers as well? That is a feature. I thought it was an issue. But this is when you're driving in the city below 50 kilometers per hour. It gives you a better, wider uh, light output. And then once you're driving above 50 kilometers per hour, it goes back to its normal position. Really cool, isn't it? Had no idea. But anyway, now if I turn the steering wheel to the right, you can see how the headlights move and if I turn to the left nothing's going to happen you actually have to be driving for the left adaptive function to activate but yeah pretty neat everything works as it should so let's roll some before and after shots Got the new strut here for the trunk floor. Ain't that nice, huh? I like that. I have a lot of space here. Good morning. It's tooth inspection time. Let's stay back. What do you think? Did it pass or fail? It failed! No, it didn't. Did you really have any doubts? I'm getting extremely cocky here, which is never good. But of course it passed. Everything is brand new on this thing. The tooth inspector was very happy and he said, yep, it's a good car. Here it is, here are the papers, take it. Yeah, it wasn't exactly like that, but anyway, the previous owner sold this thing because he couldn't pass tooth inspection. Two reasons for that. Number one, it had worn out valve stem seals, so it was burning and smoking oil, so he couldn't pass the sniff test. But number two, and sort of a bigger issue for someone who doesn't know what they're doing, 
This car was imported from Dubai and it's Middle East spec. It was sold brand new over there. And as such, when you go and buy data sheet from the dealer, from BMW, which is something you need for the tooth inspector so you can inspect the car because all of the data information about the car is on there, it says that the car is Euro 2. And when you have a paper like that, you can't even do the tooth inspection because the car is 2009. You can't have Euro 2 on such car. Euro 2 was surpassed in Germany back in the 90s. So what I had to do is reach out to Oli from Oi Motors, who is an awesome guy. He's always been there for me whenever I needed any help with coding or whatever. And he was able to connect with his laptop to the computer, well, remotely through my laptop to the computer, and uh, program the DME to Euro 4 software, ECE software. In fact, the DME was already programmed back in 2014, so all he did was just confirm that the car has Euro 4 software, wrote me a paper that the car has that and that part number and it's Euro 4, and I gave all of that to the tooth inspector, and he was able to inspect the car with that, and now I have papers, five, six of them, where it says, well, first of all, it says own in mangle, which means no defects. And it also says Euro 4. So now I can finally register the car. But right now I'm gonna take the car inside, remove the front wheels. Uh, even though the front winter tires are brand new, they're run flats and I don't like run flats. They make for one really bumpy ride. So I purchased the same set of winter tires that I bought for the rear. Yes. In previous life, I was a Spider-Man or a Batman. I'm not sure, but one of those two. My landlord thinks I'm a lunatic. Good car, good car. No. We're down to some final things like this faded trim that goes all the way around the car. I said in the previous episode that I'm going to paint this, but it's currently below zero. It's snowing, so painting, it ain't gonna happen. My paint booth, even though it's state-of-the-art facility, can't handle snow. So instead, we're gonna degrease this, surface prep it, and then use trim coating from Gion. So this coating is essentially like ceramic coating. So you apply it the same way you apply ceramic coating. Okay. Looking good, Mr. Qatar. Finish ceramic coating all of the trim on the car, the side skirts, the little stripes on the door, the mirrors, the headlights, and this bumper trim here, it had, or it still has, small damage here. It was a lot worse before. My landlord and I used the heat gun and just kind of melted all of this back together, and now it looks about 80% better. I actually wanted to buy a brand new uh, cover here, but it's 500 euro brand new, and that's a bit too much for something that's going to inevitably get damaged again. So this works, it looks better, and now with shiny nice trim all around, the car looks about five years younger. Yeah, look at that, perfect. Finally, the steering wheel. I personally think that this steering wheel is ugly, so we are going to upgrade it. The battery is disconnected, by the way. Well, that was fairly loose. This is the replacement M Sport steering wheel, which as you can see, looks a lot better than the old one. It also feels much better in your hands. I bought it in used condition, overall great shape, no major wear or tear, just a nice used steering wheel. Besides the look and feel, the airbag cover is different as well. And the E70 platform had a recall for steering wheel airbags and this particular car had that recall done. This is a brand new airbag and I also have an invoice for that. So we're simply going to remove the airbag from this cover and put it in this brand new cover that I bought and that fits the steering wheel. First, we're gonna transfer over the wiring. Okay, so now we need to gingerly get this out and put it in this one. There are 16 million clips, so zip ties to the rescue. Now we need to unbolt this thing and we are going to mark its position. This one goes on the top. According to the repair instructions, you also wanna put tape over the connectors here so you don't accidentally touch them and set the thing off. Now we can pull this up. These clips are vicious, man. 
Oh, finally. Now I'm going to remove the actual bag. The shape of the old one and the new one is exactly the same. So you just need to pack it in tightly. Clips need to be seated all around. Now the explosive. And we are ready to install this airbag. So give it a nice good and tight. Perfect. Nice. Even nicer. Horn works. Yes, it works. Yep. This car is at the moment very, very rust free, but it will be used in winter and they sold the roads like crazy here. And I want to preserve the chassis and condition of this car as much as I can. So we're gonna protect it against salt and rust and I'm gonna use fluid film. This is like wax, except it's not, it's fluid film. It's a liquid sticky substance, as you can see it over there. So you just spray it everywhere and it's gonna repel water and protect the metal from rusting. It's actually much better than paint because paint chips, this goes into every nook and cranny and it just, it'll protect the metal better against rust. So I'm gonna go around the car and wherever I see exposed chassis, metal, and I have a straw as well, so I can get in pretty much everywhere and just spray the whole car. This is something that I'm going to practice on all of my cars, even those that I don't drive in winter, because this stuff is really good against rain and water and all of that stuff. So I'm gonna mask up and begin. This stuff has a really nasty smell. It smells like rotten apples, but I sprayed it pretty much wherever I could. And this is going to protect the chassis from the salt. And you're supposed to renew this pretty much every winter. It's gonna last between six and eight months, depending on the environment. But prior to every winter, wash the underbody of the car and just coat it with this stuff. And it's gonna go a long way to prolong the life of the car. I'm gonna spray a little bit more up front and then we're done. Summer wheels, these are style code, whatever. Previously they were in terrible shape, curved all around. One of them was pretty bent. So I dropped them off with the guy, he straightened them out and refinished all four of them. Originally they would come in silver color and I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't particularly like the design of these rims. I think the style is a bit too aggressive and I actually prefer the look of these. They look a bit classier. And for whatever reason, to me, they look even worse when they're in silver. So I went with a different color, as you can see here. I went with Ferric Gray 2 B55, original BMW color for the rims. For the tires, I went with hand-cooked hand tires. The rear wheels are staggered, actually, and these are very expensive tires. Now we're going to pop these on the car for the final beauty shots. And last week, it was minus 11 Celsius. So there's no way you can drive with summer tires. This week, or today, it's 12 plus and it's going to stay like that until the end of the week so we can actually run summer tires these are rated up to 300 kilometers per hour the winter ones are rated to 240 so we can actually go a bit faster i mean the car does look sportier and aggressive with these rims so there's that and don't worry i'm going to be switching back to winter tires shortly see what i mean it just looks baller with these rims not really my style Finally, the license plates. We have Frankfurt E70X5, and we're in the process of building a brand new web shop for merchandise, products, and stuff, and hopefully I'll figure out how to sell license plate frames as well. So bear with me, it's being worked on. And now the green part is thicker. Access granted.
Here we go, driving the E70X5 4.8i with 355 PS. First stop, Autobahn, of course. Also, pay attention what happens when I take a sharp turn. What comes out of the section of the, of the roof. Sport mode. First impressions, I am amazed how stable it is at high speeds. I mean, we're doing over 200 kilometers per hour in a turn and the car feels like a tank. And this is all due to, well, good engineering of the chassis and Bilstein B6. speed is around 250. Yeah, we're gonna ease it out. It's not slow, it's not fast either, it's quick. It's a heavy car. Brakes, good. So far, I'm impressed with the car. Did not expect it's gonna handle this well. The V8 sounds brilliant. I love the N62 engine. It has plenty of power. It's linear, it just pulls and pulls. And the car is just comfortable. There's not a lot of wind noise at 200 kilometers per hour, which is my typical cruising speed on the Autobahn. The um, sunroof drains are clogged. So earlier when I took a sharp left turn, we had water coming out of this spot here. So I'll need to clean those. Interior wise, the rattle and whatnot, not as bad as the first uh, time I drove it, especially the center console. I mean, you can still hear it like that, but when you hit the bumps and whatnot, it doesn't rattle anymore. One screw was missing, so I added that. There is a very small creak in that corner of the car that I'm trying to figure out. It's not the quietest car in the world, but for a big giant box, it's decently quiet. The transmission is bellissima. It shifts perfect and it does feel quicker than the one in Alpina and it's the same transmission so we're definitely doing that service on Alpina as well. Seats are muy excelente, very comfortable, they move in so many directions like you can as you can see do that and I'm just cocooned in here so I like it. I can see the appeal why people pick SUVs, you're sitting high up, you're looking down on the peasants and you know. The sound system is not the best in the world, but for me it's good enough. I'm not a huge audiophile, there's plenty of bass. It's clear, it doesn't like crack and pop and whatever. It's a nice sound system. This is foot to the floor. What do you think about fuel consumption? Wanna take a guess? We'll calculate it a bit later, but I'm guessing 20 liters per 100 kilometers. I did drive it pretty hard. steering wheel the M Sport steering wheel is beautiful it feels great in your hands definitely a great upgrade there and I'm really glad I did the bigger brakes this car really needs it on the Autobahn it's a big heavy car but yeah you can see water dripping from here I love sunroofs I really do 
especially the big ones. Yeah, this thing is also hanging the headliner, the fabric on the cover for the panorama thing. Need to fix that. The only problem is in order to fix that, I have to remove the entire headliner. The cup holders were great. Totally worth three hours of my time to fix that cover. By the way, I drove the car at night yesterday. The headlights are epic, really, really amazing. Actually better than E60 M5 and I have brand new Hella headlights on that car. It's that good. So I think I'm gonna do this upgrade on D60 as well because they are just amazing. The light output is, it's perfect. It's so bright and shiny and the cutoff line when you're driving and just, the comfort factor is, it's pretty high. This is a comfortable car. On the road, it behaves great. It's absorbing the bumps nicely. See, doesn't really feel the bumps. There's that water. Look at this. I mean, I'm not pushing it too hard because it's really wet outside, but this is amazing. Did you see that? Huge dip in the road and it just went whoop. That's it. It didn't move, it didn't unsettle or whatever. That's really good. Wow, look at this road, huh? I like it. Hello, horsey. Spectacular. He went in wet. I'm actually enjoying the back roads in a big ass SUV. Tight turn. A uh, bit of on the steer there. Manual shifting. Great car, great car. So I just stopped by Felix in Randstadt and picked up a brand new steering wheel for Alpina. This is Alpina 2.0 steering wheel. And here's the little preview. It's gonna look awesome. Anyway, let's skedaddle. Time to get fuel and drive back home. You wait, I'm gonna go fuel up. Okay, 185, 110. We did 192 kilometers. Da -da -da. <laughs> I was close. 21.19 liters per 100 kilometers. That is ridiculous. That being said, I did drive it pretty hard, but I am curious to see what consumption ends up being when I drive it somewhat normally. Before we close out this project, let's talk about how much money I burned through to restore this thing. I'm gonna put the entire breakdown up on the screen, but I paid 9,000 European shillings for this bucket, which looking back was probably too much given its previous condition. But then again, I did buy this car when the car market was the strongest and car prices in general was super high. So even if I wanted to find a comparable example for less money, I couldn't. And the main reason we bought this one was the spec. 
Space Gray over Nevada Leather Interior. It is a beautiful and rare spec and that's what sealed the deal for us. Then I went ahead and spent a ton of money fixing it up. And before I tell you the final number, keep in mind that I'm sort of a special person when it comes to fixing the car up and the whole restoration process. I try to pay attention to every single detail and at the end of the restoration, my goal is that this car drives as close as possible to a brand new car, if not better. And with, uh, with this one, I achieved that. So the final number is 18,606 euros. I doubled my investment and then some. And I'm also pretty sure I misplaced an invoice, so 10, but that's more or less it. And if you buy this car and think you're gonna fix it up for cheap, it ain't gonna happen. This was never a cheap car to begin with. The parts are expensive and it just adds up in the end. But overall, I'm happy. It could be a lot worse. The end result is this. Original paint, rare spec, E70 X5, 4.8i, that's mechanically completely sorted. And I'm willing to bet this is one of the cleanest examples in Germany. The engine was thoroughly serviced, the transmission, the whole suspension, everything else underneath mechanically, the brakes, the headlights are better than brand new, the taillights are brand new, two sets of tires, I mean, doesn't need anything else, at least not anything big. And this high investment that we have right now should even out over the years because I expect it to be somewhat reliable and other than regular maintenance, it shouldn't need anything else. The big giant is going to stay in the collection, at least for now. We'll see how much my girlfriend is actually going to end up using this thing. And if it's not that often, then I'm going to sell this thing. Don't get me wrong. This is a phenomenal car for an SUV. It drives absolutely amazing, but I'm still not a fan of SUVs. If we are going on a road trip, I'm going to take my E60 M5 or E39 M5 or Alpina or my E31 850i, which is the project that we're restoring next. As for any future work on it, it needs a good detail, paint correction, and then ceramic coat the entire thing. But I'm gonna let someone else do that because I'm sick and tired of polishing, and we'll do that come springtime. Then I need to address some small things, remove that sticker, for example, unclog the sunroof drains, and fix the fabric on the panorama cover. I'll do that off camera just to speed things up. And uh, that's about it when it comes to this car and project. Thank you so much for following along. I hope that you enjoyed this series. It actually did a lot better than I was expecting. When I bought an SUV, I wasn't sure how it's gonna do and how everyone's going to react, but we averaged around half a million views per episode, which is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. But that brings me up to another question. We have 300 and something thousand subscribers and we're averaging around half a million views per video. What's up with that? You're watching, but not subscribing. If you're enjoying the content, please, consider subscribing. I would really appreciate that. Anyway, I'm going to go work on Project Marseille E31850i, which is going to be the next video. But before that, I got to unclog the sunroof drains. It's still heavily raining outside and I kind of don't want water inside of the car. Ciao!